I extend the greetings of the day. This is not any formal opening speech. We have reached a point of time when we need to sit down all together and discuss what the theme of our today's meeting, from a big government to a smart government, means to us. What we have accomplished in the past years and months, and what the way we have to walk along looks like. Usually such meetings start in the morning. I wish it is always morning in Mongolian government. Therefore, this meeting is being convened in the afternoon. Chief of my office, Mr. Tsagan, has just introduced that this meeting has brought together a broad spectrum of people, decision makers, businessmen, local governments, media, academia and NGOs. What I'm going to talk about today is not entirely new. We have established a working group with the representation of political parties, researchers, NGOs and the general public. And our media organizations have been attentive too. The topic of our meeting today is our key challenge, our common trouble. This is not a concern of only the government, or of the cabinet, of any one particular party, or an individual. This is a Mongolia's ordeal. Therefore, I think it is right for all of us to come together, discuss and find solutions. We should remember that we are all seen in one same color. We are all seen as one whole, Mongolia, the Mongolian government. Now let's begin with the first issue. It won't hurt to start with comparing ourselves with some countries. You are aware of the Global Competitiveness Center and of Mongolia's competitiveness report, produced annually. I shall base my talk on 2012 report, where Mongolia is compared with 14 countries against 329 criteria. It would be best if our government and people assess their performance by this criteria. So the countries of comparison are Qatar, Singapore, Malaysia, Mexico, Thailand, South Korea, Chile, Peru, Kazakhstan, Russia, Slovenia, Bulgaria, Ukraine and Slovakia. We rank the 13th by economic performance indicator, collecting 38 points. The closer a country to 100 points, the better it's performing. By government efficiency, we rank the 13th, scoring 31. In business efficiency, we are the 12th, scoring 37. In infrastructure, the 15th, scoring 20. In GDP per capita, 15th, with 4,745 US dollars GDP per capita. In economic diversification, the 15th, with two scores. In gross domestic savings, the 15th with $3 billion. In annual household saving, the 14th with $1,191 per capita of savings. An institutional investor, the 15th, scoring 34. In foreign exchange reserves, the 14th with $2 billion. In capital market value, the 15th with $1 billion. Of In direct investment stocks inward, the 15th with $4 billion. An implementation of government policies and decisions, the 15th, scoring 2. In state ownership of enterprises, the 15th, scoring 3. In skilled labor, the 15th, scoring 2. In technology development and application, the 15th, scoring 4. In energy infrastructure, the 15th, scoring 2. In air transportation, the 15th. In total public expenditure on education per capita, the 15th with 140 US dollars expenditure. In pupil-teacher ratio, the 15th, with 30 students per teacher. The World Bank produces the Doing Business Report. I've picked up indicators of rather poor performance here. On the other hand, it just can't be so that of 15 countries, we always rank the 15th, the worst. By the level of women's employment, use of mobile phones, we rank quite high. So here I'm showing the indicators which we have to attend and improve, not the ones where we're doing well. In foreign trade, we rank 181st among 189 countries. In getting electricity, which is not that difficult a job, we are 162nd among 189 countries. We're seen as a hugely bureaucratic country with very meager opportunities. In resolving insolvency, we are 133rd of 189 countries. In dealing with construction permits, we are 107th of 189 countries. Now let me explain the goal of today's national consultative meeting. We have two aims. 
First, how to grow our economy, how to achieve the growth. We've just seen comparisons of Mongolia with some countries. What opportunities for growth do we have? Are we really that bad? Second goal, let us look into the possibilities deeper. Now we know our standing in 2013. I will show you our potentials in some greater details and let's see what we would have reached by 2020, 2040 if we maintain our average current speed of growth. Our population growth. Our population today is 2.9 million people. Assuming that a family would at least have three children, which gives us a population growth rate of 2.5 percent, by 2050 our population will have reached 7 million people. Life expectancy. Now it is 68 years. By 2050, it will have grown to 85 years. Let us look at the GDP growth pattern. Here we have three scenarios. A growth rate of 5%, 10% and 12%. So if we take 10% growth rate, by 2050, our GDP will have reached 380 billion US dollars. GDP per capita is a critical indicator. Again, in any projections, we take the same three growth rates of 5, 10 and 12%. So let's take the average, 10%. By 2050, if we grow at 10% rate, our GDP per capita will have grown to 50,000 US dollars. Investment ranking. Today our ranking is double B. By 2050, we will have to triple A. Now about the Mongolian development goals. Our performance will be gradually improving along 2013, 2020, 2030, 2040 and 2050. So by 2050, our population will have grown to 7 million with average life expectancy of 85 years. We'll have 380 billion US dollars worth GDP with per capita of 55,000 US dollars and with an investment environment rated AAA. A country of rule of law and competitive. Domestic saving is an important indicator. Let us look at it as household savings. One of the fundamental factors of a country's development and stability is related to this indicator, the savings. If an individual or household has savings in the bank or any balance in the pension account, in a sense, this indicates how much money this individual or household commands. So if at the national level all of our households would keep 50 billion US dollars saving, no stone would be fatal for Mongolia. To recall the objective of today's meeting, we have set forth two goals. How do we ensure the development of our economy? How do we ensure its growth? And how do we fix our government, mend the government? If we fail to clarify our mission, our goal, people's confidence in the government will not increase. Why do people's trust and confidence in government erode? My answer, my conclusion is that the source of this distrust rests in the government itself. People say, well, the government does not deliver its promises. It is disordered. Its decisions are unstable. And the cause of such a government is the lack of shared commitment, lack of research, lack of systematization. And this means the government lacks a unified policy, lacks responsibility, lacks control. Irresponsibility, lack of control, makes the government a government which does not deliver results, whose policies are unstable and messy, whose actions are disorderly. And this is called the vicious circle. And this is our true picture today. Indeed, for 24 years we were on horseback. The time to dismount and speak out has come. If our horse is fatigued, Let's change the horse. Imagine we're on board of an airplane that needs to be fixed. Let's talk today about what needs to be fixed. Because it is an open society in Mongolia. We hear much noise and sounds here and there. Yet amidst that noise, we must distinguish the sound of an alarm. But we just can't hear, we just can't catch that sound. We must hear it. Once we hear it, we must stop and come to senses and realize what we are doing. In fact, we should have organized this meeting much earlier than today. Numbers don't lie. Therefore, let me cite a few numbers. Over the past one year, we inflicted to ourselves a loss of $1.5 billion or 2.5 trillion to groups. In 2013, 
the state budget is about to record a deficit of 1 to 1.5 trillion to groups. We owe 1 trillion to groups to our Human Development Fund. Government debt to GDP ratio. The government debt stands at 8.4 trillion to groups, or 49.5% of GDP, as the Ministry of Finance reports. That is 24% in Australia, 10% in Chile. Some say we are heading to become a country with a government debt several times the GDP. We do not need to compare ourselves with such countries. We must compare with better doing countries, for instance with Chile. If we want to bring the 2013 FDI to the level of 2011, we must double the FDI. Please note, this is exclusive of Autoto investment. Mongolia's GDP is 17 trillion Tugruks, or 10 billion dollars. With the start of 2013, it is little more into 11 billion. But let me base my talk on somewhat modest estimate, 10 billion US dollars of GDP. Fiscal expenditure and GDP ratio. When the 2014 budget was being discussed at the parliament, I inquired about the 2014 estimated fiscal expenditures. I was told it was 7.3 trillion Tugruks. The parliament, I hope, worked hard on it. So the fiscal expenditure is 7.3 trillion Tugruks, or 40% of GDP. If we add to that 1.5 billion of Chinggis bonds, 600 million dollars of the development bank, which combined make 3.5 trillion Tugruks, that will make our expenditures 10.8 trillion Tugruks. We should not exclude these two numbers from our expenditures, our budget to be prudent. So if we combine all this, our total expenditure to GDP ratio might end up to be 63.5%. Members of parliament tend to cite confusingly different numbers, but let us observe utmost prudence here. We must all see what happens when investment shrinks, production and services contract. As production and services contract, income dries up. Since there is no earning, no income, people's lives aggravate. The very source of people saying life has gotten worse, it's hard to run a business, rests precisely here. I mentioned earlier that in a period of slightly more than a year, we lost 2.5 trillion Tugruks. This is a cost borne by the people of Mongolia. From a baby in the cradle to an elderly on pension, every single Mongolian paid a cost of 863,000 Tugruks. Every Mongolian lost this much. This is a number reported by the Mongol Bank. That is the cost of inflation, the cost of various programs, the cost of securing the GDP growth rate, which taken together I define with one single word. This is the cost of populism. This much Mongolia paid for populism. The crying out loud is done by the populists, but sadly the cost is borne by the people. The time to realize this has come. Next point. I intend to run a short voting on issues we will discuss today. You have those voting devices at hand. The question is very simple. Is the Mongolian government a big government? You press A for yes, B for no, and C for don't know. I expect the officials of a smart government would know how to use a smart device. Now let's look at your response. I have another question to ask from you. Government expenditure in GDP is an important criterion. It is considered a government with normal structures, with normal expenditures. If the government's expenditure takes up for 30% of GDP and considered abnormal, wasteful, big, if the expenditures exceed 40% of GDP, and I leave it to you, how would you call a government with expenditures beyond 60% of GDP? I guess you know well that the ratio of government expenditure in GDP is a common measurement of performance. So is the Mongolian government a big government? Here we see the response. 37 responded yes, it is big. 12.6 responded no, it is not. And 4.5 responded don't know. 45% didn't press any button or confuse the buttons. Anyhow, 37 of you say that the government is big, inarguably. Now let's talk about the reasons for the government to grow big. Why is our government getting bigger? Knowledge, technological progress do not enter the government. The government tries to resolve the pressing issues by mere structural, mechanical expansion of the staff. Let me show you something interesting. 
This is the first mobile phone. We used it some 15, 16 years ago. Its function was to collect a phone number by pressing the buttons. Nothing more. We all know of a regular mobile phone of today. This is how it looks like. The computer of that time, when this old phone was produced, is now much more outdated than this phone. Now this phone has multiple functions. You all know this. And at times you complain that there are so many functions that you don't know, that you even don't understand how to use them all. So you just use three. When a technology develops, it doesn't get bigger. The more functions are developed, the linear it becomes. Then let us use this technology. Our government only grows bigger, adds more units and people as more issues come up, as more needs arise. This technology tells us that we must move to a smarter government. The second major reason for the government to grow big is the fact that it is profitable, beneficial to work for the government. By issuing licenses and permits, interfering into business and economic lives by arbitrary setting norms. There are many honest public officers, and among them there are many politicians and political officers. Working for the government is beneficial for various licensing authorities, setting norms and seeking profits by abusing those powers. As of today, there are 1,164 licenses and special permits at the national level. Some of them are no longer called licenses. Some of our officials have become masters in inventing bad practices. So the term license has been replaced with a different word. And when inspectors come to count the licenses, they disguise them under different names and submit only few. Actually, ship must be called ship, not a goat. Asking for ship, inspectors are appointed at goats. There are many ways to benefit from the government. Just to take one example, our ministers employ advisors. Some do not have any, while some have three to four advisors. There are 24 advisors working for the ministers. Some appoint their close friends or relatives as advisors. And those advisors are turning the government into a real mess. The advisors take charge of everything and are omnipresent. They run the public, business and financial affairs. Some ministry officers fear of them as of the most dangerous people. And when an issue comes up and the minister will have to be held accountable, the advisor is fired. Such lawlessness is taking wider rooms in the government bodies. Also, the IMA governors have 15 advisors, while there are governors who do not have any advisors at all. It is okay if the advisors are free of conflict of interest. But no, it is absurd to employ advisors to have them run all the dirty businesses and devastate the government. A Nobel Prize winner once warned that running a government can never be identified with running a company. Sometimes we hear that well before a director of a state-owned company is even appointed, the company is forced to purchase goods from companies that either belong to the officials or where the ultimate beneficiaries are high-ranking officials. When appointing the executive management of a state-owned enterprise, the skills and qualifications are ignored, and very often the appointment decisions are made based on the appointee's willingness to feed the minister's private interests and businesses. And everybody knows about this. In that way, the government is ravaged. In a country with assailant into wealth the government, the people are impoverished. We may not let it happen when the government collects the cream and the people fight on the leftovers. And this is the secret of why people remain poor while the economy is growing. The government is dashing into wealth, snatching it away from people. The third reason of why the government is swelling, lack of unity and cohesion in the government work. Because there is no unity, most part of the government is doing the same kind of job. We see too many people do a work that is doable by just one man, just one person, in one span of time, single span of effort. Therefore, the government turns into a fire extinguisher, a brainless, monotonous machine, and the officials live like feudal lords. I was telling this earlier to lawmakers and law enforcers. Now I will repeat this for you. Being a minister, an official in the government, is not an insignia of a privilege. Being a minister means that you have to serve one certain concrete task. For instance, Minister of Defense is in charge of providing for defense. Energy Minister is in charge of energy policy. 
There is no entitlement to power. Unfortunately, very often the officials take themselves for the holders of ultimate powers. Drawing an analog with an orchestra, ministers and officials are simply musicians playing different instruments. We can't ask a flute player to play a violin. So if you are a violinist, play your violin. If you are a flute player, play the flute. So in the government, you are appointed to do your job. And if you can't, you have to leave. A fair demand, isn't it? A survey conducted to establish the ways our people interact with the government revealed interesting findings. 60% of respondents say they did not interact with the government at all. 30% interact sometimes. And 8% responded they communicate with the government at all times. So the government must be structured to respond to this pattern. Another survey to find out what the businessmen want from the government indicated that 42% of them wants the government not to hamper businesses. Some asked for stability. 20% wanted support. Businessmen want just three things. Stable, equal and transparent legal environment. They want a predictable taxation environment. They want the government not to interfere, but a government that helps at the times of need. A government that does not have any conflict of interests and that does not compete with the businesses. Indeed, it is not right for the government to establish companies and compete with private businesses. These are the businessmen who are the oppressed class in the society today. There is a whole system to oppress them. Pressure of inspectors, then pressure of officials to purchase their company's goods and services. What the officials like about the businessmen is money. Then the pressure of law enforcers, and when they speak to businesses, they cite big names, names of officials. We must stop this. We must tear this mechanism apart. From now on, let us start breaking this machinery at each of our government offices. I observed a number of ills of the government, and I have listed them. You can add more. 1. The government is everywhere. The government decides everything. 2. Accountability, not a big deal. This is something we can fool around with. 3. The one who becomes an official acts as he or she pleases. 4. Research, theory, don't count if you have experience. 5. An election program must only be liked by voters. 6. If the government does not own assets, someone else will benefit. 7. A decision maker cares only for today, free of problems. Tomorrow doesn't matter. These are the seven ills defining the Mongolian government today. Speaking of which, it is unacceptable of politicians thinking of voters only during the election race and after the election thinking only of themselves. The government which tries to do everything for you, in fact, deprives you of everything. Now let's go back to our talk about a smart government. The path for Mongolia to go is clear. It is the path of rule of law, smart government, an open, inclusive, safe society. In the old socialist times, we were forced to learn by heart socialist slogans. Now I want you to memorize these few words. A government is called open and democratic if it provides for security, serves the citizens, and upholds the law. I must carry on my mission in a system which maintains these three fundamental principles. In such a system, my mission, your mission, is achievable. Today we have every need, every exigency to move to a smart government. This is consistent with our goal to build a humane democratic society. Circumstances, environment, attitudes are changing. The public demands the government to be smart. People often say in their ordinary daily conversations, oh, you need to be smarter, you need to grow smarter. In the new century, elements, features of the old system, of the past century, even of the past year, are outmoded. Some eight years ago, we launched an e-Mongolia, digital Mongolia program. Today, we're just being forced to talk about smart Mongolia, smart government. This attitude has become a prevalent common tendency. The UN has started producing the Smart Government Index. Republic of Korea ranks the first by this index. We're not talking about something void or unknown to others or not done yet somewhere else. This is a common prevailing trend. Most importantly, a new generation has arrived. 
those small children of the 90s are adults today who make up new Mongolian families. Mongolians have a tradition to assemble a new gear, build a new home for their children who form their own families. Following this tradition, we must renew our government for our new generation. So how do we distinguish a smart government? A smart government offers services regardless of spatial and time constraints. Laws and regulations in a smart government are precise. Operations uphold standards. An integrated database in a smart government is a must. It supports its citizens to develop skills, be ethical, creative and proactive. It does not only serve the citizens, but also helps its citizens to obtain education and be ethical. It provides the most optimal solutions to emerging issues, emerging demand. It must be capable of doing its work in the most efficient manner. We can identify a smart government by a picture, for instance. Today, public officials sit in offices with big doors and behind big walls. In a smart government, officers see each other. They are like dispatchers. A smart government needs only dispatchers who can see and check the managers. This is how our ministries and agencies should look like. If we organize ourselves this way, we should be able to accomplish a lot. And we've actually started this process. Recall how we used to organize our elections in the past. Citizens turned into losers, houses torn or burned down. And did all of this happen again after we started using electronic voting machines? The Kyrgyz foreign minister told me, I attended the ceremony of your presidential oath of office. You won the election at a slight margin. But nothing happened the next day after the election. I feared a strike might break out as happened in Kyrgyz. The people who attended the ceremony were rejoicing as if participating in a festival. There was nothing to dispute about the election. We just counted the votes by machines. We shall continue using technologies and machines. Imagine how many services people will start receiving after government service kiosks start operating, when people will no longer have to communicate with officials. We must now alter our structures to feed those kiosks. Officials just cannot be imposing themselves sitting in the kiosks. A smart government must operate just like a modern clinic. I heard that the city municipality is having a job scheme developed by Mobicom. This is a commendable decision. The capital city is developing its integrated database. Behind integrated, we see efficiency. A lot of early duplicated functions will be performed through one single integrated system, integrated network. Government will achieve enormous efficiency through this system. Many countries, especially cities, are moving to smart systems. For instance, there is a system called cloud, Ud in Mongolian. So our city run by Batul will move to a city of Pangul, Pan Cloud. We will have a Pan system and let us become a Pan Mongolia. Pan means united, integrated. So let us develop an integrated network of services. You all know how much change, speed and efficiency was brought about by inventing conveyors in early 20th century. This system that I'm talking about is that very conveyor, the government's conveyor. Republic of Korea has set forth a goal to be the smartest country in the world. Mongolia will also put forward the same goal. Mongolia must be a country of the smartest governors, of the safest society of the most effective services. People talk a lot about the recipes for government success. I will tell you of just one single recipe. The government serves one and only goal, a human desire to live a decent life, period. That's all. Just give a man or a woman an opportunity to live a life he or she wishes to live. A smart government is a government which does all the paperwork, a government of rules, of research, of technology, of people with skills and capacity. This is what the people of Mongolia, our time, demands from us. In Chinggis Khan times, the Mongolian government was the smartest, was the most capable government. In those times, Mongols did establish the horse stations so admired in the world, the source of today's information network. Let us bring back to the government all those best practices which we once had. Let's bring every progressive, every best practice of the modern world to the Mongolian government. We're not talking here about today of something alien, uncomprehendable. I'm not telling you to be smarter in a smart government. I'm just asking you to use the technological progress. Is this such an unmanageable demand? 
The phases of the decision-making process in a smart government are truly crucial. As you recall, one of the seven ills of the government, as I mentioned earlier, was ignorance of research. The primary phase, the monitoring, is a must in the process. We have at hand information, statistics, people's ideas. While the second phase is the phase of analysis, reports, research, planning. The third phase is the synthesis phase. Solution alternatives, projections, decisions. A smart man is always ethical. A smart government is a responsible government. Ethical and responsible government is respected by its people. The founding principles of the policies and actions of a smart government. Rule of law, openness, citizen participation, cooperation of public organizations, citizens, local governments. A policy to measure the inclusive and stable growth must be present. And we must pursue inclusive economic growth. These are the core basic principles of the policies and actions of a smart government. These days we often hear a phrase, inclusive economic growth. What this means is that if an economy ever grows, people will have benefited from this growth. This is how we measure, how we define inclusiveness. Growth is not about having the economy grow by 70% with the people further impoverishing. And a smart government should base upon an integrated database, research and analysis. A smart government rests on the juncture of three times. It carries the best from the past, meets the needs of the present, and is visionary about the future. A smart government, therefore, cannot be devised by hand-drawn sketches. It is built with the help of technological progress. How does the structure of our government look like today? What structure do we have to move to? A smart government is a government of efficiency, a unit to provide for enforcement and implementation of law and regulations. Another unit is in charge of research and development. Third, a unit of service provision. Under the fourth unit, the support for operations, I included contracts and leasing. What services and products can the government purchase by contracts and leasing? Does the government need to own any furniture, office building, any such properties at all? All of this can be rented from other parties. An office building can be rented. I heard the municipality was going to move to a new building. Let it sell its black tower upon just one condition that the government won't rent some space back in it. You'll see our businesses will just rush to buy the, the building. Why? Because a tenant, the government is there. So the lesser will have a permanent income. Just privatize, sell that black tower and let all government agencies rent space there. All of our agencies can fit in one single building. Or tear down those ruins of the printing house next to the government house. Build on the area a new building and let all the ministries rent space there. Connected with this house with an underground corridor. That's it. In Mongolia, only the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs can operate in separate buildings, but all others can reside in the same building. Once the government starts renting, they will learn of the problems and miseries of others who rent. While the government makes wrong decisions, adopts bad practices, nurtures inflation, etc., but once it becomes equal to other lessees, they will live their lives. They will live the lives of lessees. Let us have common same problems with our people. This is how the government has to house itself. These cars, offices, services, all can be rented. A driver's salary, social insurance payments. This will no longer be on the government once the service is leased. The lesser company shall be in charge of all this. And once the government starts living the same life, the economy will come into motion. Only those who profit from the old system and structures would oppose this new arrangement. Mongolia will have a smart government. We will make sure this happens. We have talked about this a lot. Enough is enough. Now is the time to decide, to act. We have so far held numerous meetings, conferences, forums, talks, research, etc. Now we need only three things. Action, decision, implementation. That's all. From today on, the Mongolian government should move to the modus operandi I'm talking about the modus operandi of a smart government. Therefore, I'm introducing law drafts. Let us stop creating new licenses. And if a need really arises, licenses and permits should be initiated by law. 
Let us stop having every official enact a license. Let us do a license or special permit census registration and let's announce which ones are valid. Let us know all what we have and where. Let's invalidate those unnecessary. Let us have only the parliament approve them according to a certain procedure. I hope you recall my tearing apart licenses and special permits on this very podium a few years ago. If a license earns a rent, earns a profit to an official, the license multiplies. It grows many like a weed. Therefore, let us fight not with the weed itself, but with the soil it grows on. Let us remove the soil. Let us cover the soil with cement, with concrete. In that way only we can fix our problems. Let us move those officials and offices which issue licenses to the private sector. Let the government sign a contract with them and you set up an entity which issues licenses. You will have some privileges in the first year of operation, but starting from the second year, you will have to compete with other companies with similar functions. That is what the government should tell them. There is nothing difficult here. The government will retain a few licenses and special permits associated with the countries and the public security. Let the parliament have the least of such permits approved. This will make it difficult for any further pushes to enact more licenses. But look at what's happening today. When we say, for instance, at the Border Customs, that we must invalidate 20 licenses and require only two, they still require the same 20 permits and licenses. The government has already started the process, yet on site, in real life, it is not implemented. So therefore, let us make it a law. A law is our rule. And because officials are arbitrarily setting norms beyond laws, we do not make any progress on this front. There should be a procedure telling an official, an officer, how he or she should work without surpassing the law. The second law we need is a law to restrict government's business operations, the maintain itself, prohibiting to establish new state-owned entities. In case a state-owned enterprise or a company needs to be established, they must be formed by law to be enacted by the parliament. The board of directors of the state-owned enterprises must be separated from public service and the state-owned enterprises must adopt the best corporate governance models. Let us explore and use other means of investment and financing, called IPOs. Let us set profitability criteria. If the company makes no profit, there is no point for the government to own it, to keep it. Let the parliament and government discuss the performance reports of the state-owned entities every year. The structure of the state property committee must be reorganized to conform with international benchmarks and standards. There are 101 state-owned companies in Mongolia today. They employ 47,653 people. A smart government is not a government which runs businesses. We have a famous company called Irpnis Talantalga. It should not be that company's business to transport coal. In a smart government, how should a company look like? Very simple. A company to be owned by a smart government must be a company of law a company of paperwork, a company which concludes agreements and sees to the enforcement of these agreements. If the contract or agreement is not enforced, hold those wrong accountable. What's the point for this company to mine coal, to transport it? There are ample possibilities to change the situation in that way, so let's just do it. Now let us enact a law on glass account. I issued a decree on this issue. These days many organizations are adopting this system. Now let's have a law to be enforced by all government organizations, state-owned entities and companies, that all fiscal expenditure decisions above 1 million tubrooks shall become open. The timeline will be set. Within 24 hours, your expenditure decision will have to be posted on the website or your information board. Let's prescribe in the law that if an official fails to declare the decision this way, this failure will be the ground for his or her dismissal holding the official accountable for the failure to enforce his or her duty set by law. The accountability provision is one thing which our lawmakers oftentimes forget when enacting a law. So now let us not forget about it. Many individuals, many companies are annoyed and fed up with the government and politics. But there is one thing that interests them, money. They are interested to see and know how well or poorly the taxpayer's money is spent. The next law is a law on government investment. For years we've been talking about the government or public investment. Let us finally cross all T's and dot all I's in that issue. 
Let us stop the government investment projects which the private sector can implement and let us stop owning an equity by debt. Let the government approve the list of investments that the government must finance. For instance, it is the duty of the government to build electricity and heat transmission lines, but the government just doesn't build them because it does not, the city is not expanding, no new projects are implemented. Other investments, estimated by established formula, should be given at the discretion of the local governments and citizens to be decided and dispersed through the community development funds. Keep just three or four investment projects in the list, invest in those, and don't care about other investments. The government does not need to build kindergartens. Instead, if a company builds a kindergarten for the children of its employees, let the government pay for the variable cost per child. If, say, some parents, a mother of a child, wants to build a kindergarten, give her a loan at 8% interest rate, just like the one provided for purchasing housing. This will have all our kindergarten shortages resolved within one year. Another principle. Mongolians like government investment very much. Government investment extends over years. A building is built, but there is a total mess with its maintenance, repair. Let us abide by one principle here. If law or contract do not provide otherwise, let the investor pay for the current expenditures of the built facility. That's all. If a local government builds a facility, it should pay for its current expenditures. If the government built it, the government should pay for current expenditures. A clear demand. That will prevent a fever to build three kindergartens in one soon. For the builder now pays for the current expenditures. Only in matters of special needs, the government invests. The Ayu 34% has proven to the fullest that the government does not need to own equity. Is that right? The government can only own shares, shares which are traded, valued. Let us adopt a law on government procurement. What could be the core ideas here? Government budget is to be spent for purchases of only domestically produced goods and services. From the start till the end, this process has to be open and transparent to the public. Let the public, local communities, openly discuss government's purchase of goods and services and let them decide. Let us set profitability and other criteria for the government and let's announce them. Here we must be aware of the wholesale principle. Say a school needs to be rehabilitated in a zone. For such a case, needed materials will have to be purchased from outside. However, if we have to fix all schools of one entire IMOG, why not establish a plant locally? We just need to support domestic industries in that way. The costs are extremely high. The completion is punishingly slow because we do one job at a time. If we support domestic industries, we shall have our own industrial production base and people will have jobs. Thus, they will earn income. Let me tell you just one revealing example. It has become so easy to build a facility in an apartment building, for instance, construction companies say. Land is secured, the foundation is dug, the frames are set, and as soon as the erection starts, private companies, private businesses and shops just switch to them offering everything a constructor company might need. Some want to supply cement, some windows and doors, some can do insulation, electricity, some want to provide furniture. This is how our smart service should be provided. People will come to the government with offers. And the only thing the government will have to care for is to have these people compete in merits and skills. You will see, within a very short period of time, the government's performance will have dramatically improved. Let's work and do this way from now on. If the government really starts operating this way, we will no longer be called bad names, corrupt, shady, gluttonous government. Let me highlight one point here. People are asking for the rights they are deprived of. They are just saying, give me my bid back, give me my right back. Good tenders, good bids are seized by the government, they say. Well, people say, I'm a carpenter. Let me make the furniture for the Sum governor's office by all quality standards. Please stop the minister supply tables to the Sum government. After having heard this, what I've just said, many people now will approach the government in cities, in Sums. Expect them to tell you, let me paint your government building next spring. I import good paints, or I can establish a paint plant here at my Sum. Such an attitude shall make a drastic change, shall develop domestic, national industries. So shall we resolve the tender problem this way? 
Now the next law. We lack a consolidated development goal. Let us have a law on this issue, an issue of having a solid integrated objective. There is one holistic goal, most widely known in the world, the Millennium Development Goals. We do make decisions, our national development goals, but they are not implemented. There is one thick book, incomprehensible, with numerous provisions. The UN MDGs fit just on two pages, with some 20 only provisions. The same should be a case in Mongolia, a document containing some 10 plus provisions. Our goal must be first measurable, second achievable, third easy to understand. Let us develop them and set by law. Let us discuss these goals. Let us set in the law how we increase our GDP and household savings. Also, let us have all government organizations and officials fill in statements before they make a decision. What do we do now? We collect comments from ministries, from here and there, and this lacks any order, any cohesion. This statement I'm talking about should show whether the decision is consistent with the laws of Mongolia, whether they are consistent with the Mongolian development goals, whether they are financially sound, economically efficient and socially beneficial, that's all. Another provision that the law must contain is about the ways and means the election candidates, both parties and individuals, envisage in their platforms to ensure the implementation of the Mongolian development goals. And that's it. The auditing and election bodies must check for compliance. Let the parliament and government discuss at least once a year the implementation of the MDGs, Mongolian development goals. It must also be added in the law that once in five years the MDGs be amended. Speaking of the statement, let me share with a very important idea that is behind every decision, after every decision there should be a paper left. Your decision and your statement should be a guide for the next generation of public servants. How visionary the official was then. Although the project did not earn financial gains, it was implemented for its social benefits and the fruits are being enjoyed today. As what the future public servants would be speaking of you, another reasoning. When an inspection arrives at an organization, there is nothing, no records against which to compare the current state. These statements that I'm talking about will be a basis of comparison and assessment. So completing a statement must be made mandatory by law. This model is already now being put in place. Judges at primary instance have already started filling out such statements before they start a case. And the quality of the judge's decisions is assessed against those statements. Lately, the Supreme Court has become a source of disappointing, ears-burning news. Looks like the Supreme Court is growing fond of invalidating cases involving big sums of money or people commanding huge stocks of money. A few such decisions have been made recently. I must state it here that although the Supreme Court is an independent entity, its decisions are sources of guidance for the people of Mongolia on the way we go now and in the future. Mongolia is working hard to reform our legal and judicial systems and establish justice. The reforms are actively underway at the moment. We shall complete the reform to the fullest. We need to enact another 30 plus laws. We will have them in place. And in line with these reforms, we have to reform the government. There is a saying, like father, like son. The son looks like his father. A foal takes after the mayor. To have a good son, let the mother be good. Therefore, we need to work with the mother, with the source, with the origin. Let us make our government smart, immune to corruption and red tape. If we manage to make our government smart, the processes and decisions at courts shall become different. Now the next law. I said earlier, we need research analysis. A smart government is a research and development organization. Only research and development organizations must serve the ministers of a smart government because the minister is going to make the decisions. Research and analysis should reach the minister before he or she makes a decision. By research and analysis, the minister must be reminded of and assisted to reflect the right points, the right ideas. There must be research bodies which use the latest advancements in technology. Let us establish a Mongolian Development Institute. Let us provide by law for the independence of the institute and set the criteria for its researchers and scholars. Without adding vacancies and without increasing the budget, let us establish it on the basis of the Center of Strategic Studies and the National Development Institute. The mission of the institute is to do research, make assessments and provide policy counseling 
to the policymakers on Mongolia's long-term development and strategies. The main fault of our decision makers is making arbitrary decisions, led by emotions, mood, whatever spontaneously comes to their mind first. Therefore, we need research, analysis. Let us resolve this issue once and for all. Every country has a government. Let us build the best. Law on public service. A smart government needs smart officers. Let us appoint the public servants based on their merits and skills. Merit-based principle. Where and if possible, we should be choosing the merited and skilled of the people residing in the administrative purview of the local government. Let us restrict new appointments in the public service. Restrain the officials in your organizations. If the public servants do not meet the merit criteria, ask them to leave the office. A public service does not need to be in the public service until his or her retirement. The government is not a nursery of bureaucracy or sanatorium for bureaucrats. If you meet the requirements, you stay. If not, please leave the government. Nothing more. And the government must adhere to this principle very strictly. Pays and remunerations shall be based on performance and citizen satisfaction. Only the best, the honest, the skilled should work for the government. This must be our only principle. All in all, there are 161,612 public servants and there are some 47,653 people working for the state-owned entities. We're talking about these structures, of this many people, of this scale and magnitude. Now the next law, a law on the decisions of the government organizations and officials, registration and control thereof. This is another area of big failure, but not really much talked of. Mongolian ministers and other government officials today are making decisions beyond the powers of the member of the parliament, Ministers, heads of agencies under them, officials here and there, and are exercising this power of making all sorts of decisions. And eventually, when inspection and auditing comes up to the decisions, these officials rank these decisions as confidential. They hire a sibling of their wife by issuing a confidential order. Is there any sense of rectitude? And they do not show, do not submit these decisions for auditing or inspection. They conceal them, even tear them to shreds. There is one single only institution in Mongolia which makes the law, sets the norms. The parliament, not you, a government official. There should be no single decision made elsewhere, especially a political official. This is not your job to be hiring or firing people. This is your general manager's job. This is what makes the government an awful place. You please go and visit any government organization. Ask for and check for their decisions and resolutions. So only by enacting a law on the decisions, registration and control of these decisions shall we be able to establish the government's institutional memory. Now another point, the decisions are not formalized. A parliament decision, resolution, comes into effect on the day it is adopted or after 10 days of publishing in media. But what happens with the decisions that adopted at the cabinet or ministerial level? There have been many cases when these decisions are forgotten, not formalized, for whole three months. And they are deliberately not formalizing the decisions, waiting. You probably guess, waiting for what? Such ugly practices must be eliminated. Therefore, we need a single integrated registry. The next law. Law on the structure of the government and state administrative organizations. After every election, there is a havoc in the government. Let us stop this 24-year-long mess. Therefore, let us prescribe by law the structure of the government to be capable and lean, consistent with the principles of a smart government. And let us pen it down in the law that the system will be stable, that it will be maintained for 10 years, and the law can be changed by two-thirds of the parliament members. Otherwise, this chaos, lawlessness, in changes, replacements and appointments after every election will never end. Do you think smart people come to serve in the government today? The government has turned into a collection of party cronies, family friends and people with utmost conflict of interests. The government is not an incubator for such a crowd. But think of it, in 1911 we had five ministries. In 1998, when I was the prime minister, my cabinet had nine ministries. Now, in 2013, do you know how many ministries do we have? 16 ministries. 
Now let us think over it. The time to think has long come. Plus, let us eliminate the duplication of official positions. This is what I wanted to share with you. Why I am saying for 10 years, by two-thirds of parliamentary votes, some adjustments in the government must be automatic, have time limits, have boundaries and limitations. Because this invites room for discipline. Let us have these fixtures and adjustments tuned automatically. In many aspects, the government can be identified with an airplane. Let us just take one example. This vehicle, called an airplane, was invented pursuant to the laws of nature. Imagine someone comes in and starts changing it, as he pleases, cut the wings, change the shape, make it in a box, and you try to fly in it. So the government is like an airplane, with same functions, for same purposes. It provides utmost care for the security. Does it adhere to rules and orders? Yes, it does. It does strictly uphold laws and rules. Does it serve the people? Yes, it does. It does serve the people. For 30 passengers, there is one flight attendant. For a plane with 300 passengers, 10 people serve on board. Look then, what's the situation in the government? Too many cooks spoil the broth. You see, the government must function like an airplane. The duties of the crew members are clear, set, ordered, landing and taken off have strictly set timelines. An airplane has a dashboard, a control board, and it does work well. The dashboard of our government is not working. It lost control. Imagine yourselves in a plane with dysfunctional control board. How would you feel? Do you think the dashboard of the Mongolian government is working? Think of it. Can we hold the officials accountable for their misdeeds and errors? Not at all. I have introduced you 10 laws to be initiated. This is our prime, first and foremost work to fix the state of today, to move from a big government to a smart government. Let us all together accomplish this work. Now another point. Tasks needing immediate action. We need to hold a poll. Let us ask just three questions at administrative units, ministries, agencies. First, do we need all these, these ministries, agencies, departments, officers, divisions, units? Second, ask yourself, do we need to have these officials, chairmen, advisors, reference, specialists, experts, and see the answers? Let us hold those who fail to do so accountable. Besides, ask yourselves, does the government need to pay for these houses, offices, cars, furniture, services? Does the government need to engage in all of this? Does all of this need to be kept and paid with taxpayers' money? Why cannot all this be delegated to others, non-governmental organizations, professions and trade associations, companies, local governments, citizens? If I ask these questions now, the shortest and easiest answer you would give to me would be, but there is a law provided for all this, Mr. President. Okay, that law will be changed. That law will be invalidated. Let us do the way we do when we're doing away with licenses and permits. Most importantly, the government must start the work with itself. Here I must make one point. The reluctance of the government to cut expenditures of its own, to reduce itself. The government cuts everything except itself. An official cuts everything, but not his own expenditures. This is what is redundant. To a minister, all other ministries look bulky, except his own. But your own ministry does indeed have an excess. Therefore, start with your own self, your own ministry or department or agency. In the Mongolian government, an average official incurs 3 million Tobruk's cost a month. Cars, fuel, his office, electricity, heating, just name it. It even exceeds 3 million. Add to that phones, post. If we get rid of just one official, his expenditures, we will be able to pay for the child money of 150 children. Here I'm talking about those 20,000 Tobruk's allowance per child. We tend to cut on our investments and our people. We must seek to correct these wrongs to fix the problems with the structures, an agency, a ministry, and then we will see how much we can really save from this exercise. This is not difficult. Just look at it as an opportunity, as something we must do, as something doable. Let us look at it as a way to develop our economy, as a business, if you wish. Now all our researchers have a job, have a project to work on, a research on how to make the Mongolian government smart. Here we have ICT companies. Please bring in your ideas, proposals. Now you will have work to do. Your business will start moving ahead. With the delegation and transfer of government functions to other institutions, there will be more space for businesses to emerge. More plants and factories will be established. Let us work this way. We must do it anyway. 
but we should not do it in our old mentality, old perception of the government. The sense of any reform lies, in fact, not in implementing new ideas, but in getting rid of the old. Now about what the parliament has to accomplish. I have listed 10 tasks. 1. An integrated comprehensive system of open parliamentary hearing, auditing and control and accountability must be established. The accountability system encompassing the suspension of full powers, release and dismissal from official position of officials appointed by parliament, president and the government needs to be practiced. Paradoxical things happen at times impunity with subsequent appointments to high positions or sentencing and jailing. But a human life has many spectra in between. The parliament is sitting idle on this front. We must adopt a system by which an official appointed by the president can be removed from the post or suspended by the decision of the parliament. The same can be practiced by the government. Just think of it. If the parliament calls to its session an official publicly reported to have violated laws, questions him or her, and upon voting at a standing committee session, dismisses from the position, Mongolia will be the most responsible country. And then this practice shall be adopted at the IMA, SUM level. Mongolian government shall become a responsible government. It will be a government proud in front of its people. You fail to act so. We just have to change ourselves this way. The parliament may not ratify a deficit budget. The fiscal stability law must be strictly enforced. Fiscal discipline must be tightened. If you look at the budget as a target, the parliament must have hit 10 marks. Just think of how many marks you hit in the 2013 target. Did you check? Did you hit at least seven? Now for 2014 budget, may your shoots be sharp. Hope at least 10 you hit. The right to initiate laws on budget and fiscals must exclusively be given to the government. The members of the parliament must stop initiating such laws. Government procurement and administrative costs must be frozen for some time. We must have laws regulating government bonds, credits, their disposal, spending, servicing. We now have Chinggis bonds, a topic we like to talk about a lot. Development bank, a whole stock of other issues deserving attention. Before you spend money, have the law in place on which the National Security Council has already issued recommendations. It is the time to adopt this law. Why would the government itself be dispersing the loans, isn't it so? And without any control. That's why we need the law in the first place, and then only talk about dispersing loan funds. Chinggis bonds will have to be repaid in four years. I worry for the development bank not to turn into a nest of bad assets. I wish to never hear such awful news. Control on the central bank must be tight. Gold and currency reserves optimal ratios must be kept and increased then the parliament must establish in its structure a subcommittee to support government reform and economic growth. Also, issues surrounding international and investment agreements should be raised only at the proposal or initiative of the government. By law, we must prohibit a public and political official negotiate an investment agreement. A professional team of experts must deal with such tasks. I'm talking about the government, about the economy, Let's use our own homemade energy. Let's create in our energy system opportunities for increased production, reliable supply and opportunities to export the excess. Let's promptly develop the railway projects, build the new railroad, resolve the transit transport issues, decide on the railways reform, implement the policy to produce fuel domestically. First, let's conclude long-term agreements to provide for multiple sources of supply then, based on domestic resources, let's start building our national industry, and from today. Bring the level of non-mining exports to 30%. Let's develop air transport. Mongolia, with her vast lands, does indeed have the potential to become a regional hub for international goods and passenger transport and ground service. Besides, if we introduce small jet services, this could emerge as a service even cheaper than these officials riding cars today. Therefore, we must make sure that all of does take place in Mongolia. Let's act promptly. Let's support our exports and support import substituting industries. Let's base our growth on mining, livestock breeding, farming, new technologies. The government must pay more concerted attention to investments. Do not be alert to the job of the lazy people. When the government gets a loan, it spends without control. Beware, later on it is paid by the people. There are two major faults in our government. 
a member of the cabinet remains a member of parliament, wearing double cloth, double del. This is wrong. Second, it is wrong for the government to be fond of loans. If indeed the country has major issues pending immediate solutions, table them at the parliament, make necessary laws. Our and Tavantodra issues must be expeditiously resolved. A national expert consulting team, a national project fund needs to be established. The government should not be writing project itself. Let all these businesses bring their projects. Let's support the projects and productions with feasibility studies conducted, with secured bank loans. That's all. This will bring the Mongolian businesses up. There is absolutely no sense for the government to be trying to do all this by itself, to try to own a part in the business. Let us eradicate pressures on businesses, do away with the shadow economy, let us conduct a tax reform to support growth. What I have kept telling to you is that the government must enforce laws and standards. Professional inspectorate is a standard enforcer. You know one truth very well. The quality standards of vodka yurut are best secured by vodka hara. If the vodka producer fails to meet the standards, just hold it accountable. Sometimes the government likes fishing in troubled waters, doesn't it? The government's inspecting, placing professional inspectorate while sneaking a bottle or so of vodka. How disgraceful is all this? Such practices must be cut down at root. We must improve the country's investment rating, invigorate the capital market, establish the sovereign wealth and trust fund system. When we say the country, we must mean the people. When we say the government, the state, we must mean law. We must strictly pursue common international standards, high technological standards. One thing that I would like to specifically highlight here, European standards, Japanese and German technologies, period, nothing else. We do not need to set our own standards, best standards do already exist. Such standards must be observed for investments. We need technological services of such standards. This is the way we have to go. These are the three closest, three most feasible standards that we have to adopt. This by itself will resolve many of our problems. We must seek to actively participate in regional integration, pay concerted attention to our relations with our neighbors. Associating with the government, I have highlighted mostly economic issues, economy, money, with good or bad policies or intentions, do leave consequences, do leave footprints. We must constantly remind ourselves of this. Another few issues. Human development should be our core aim. Everyone wants his or her child to be healthy, educated, ethical and positive. Therefore, we must immediately undertake radical reforms in education, health, insurance systems. We must support the development plans of the capital city, IMAX. Another set of pending issues is land, its surrounding relationships, ownership, use, etc. We must resolve all of this. Now a message for the businesses. Businesses include state-owned enterprises and private companies. Let's move away from the government and family ownership to public ownership. Companies with sales of 100 billion tobruks must go public. Trade at least 30% of your stocks on the Mongolian Stock Exchange. This will obligate the government to run the stock exchange efficiently. If 10,000 people hold stocks of your company, your company will be protected by 10,000 people. 10,000 people will stand against wrong decisions of the government. 10,000 people shall start creating value with you. What good an ownership by a handful of people would do? We must solve this issue once and for all. Corporate governance, corporate social responsibility will be enhanced. At this meeting today, we have a whole group of media workers and journalists present. I want you all to conduct public debates and discussions on the issues we're discussing here today. We have representatives of local governments. Let us conduct similar to today's discussions, discussions in our local areas about the future. Please discuss these issues in your IMAC, in your SOM. Define your development goals and priorities. Companies, public organizations can also discuss these ideas to move to smarter models of operation and system. If the proposed laws, projects are not undertaken, I shall push, remind and cooperate. I shall work to provide for the integrity of policy and actions. Rule of law, government reforms, national security remind my key priorities. Plus the seven amendments to the Constitution have to be attended. You will be shortly given my presentation slides with notes. I wish we hold successful discussions this afternoon and thank you.